the second days of the corn uh, today. Uh, before we start, uh, a couple of uh, announcements. Uh, uh, first of all, um, yeah, I want to tell you that uh, we are probably will try to make some kind of a group photo. Uh, we it depends on the number of people and how, how many people will attend uh, will come throughout uh, this uh, uh, morning session. But it will be either uh, now, uh, I mean, at the end of the morning session or uh, uh, later on this afternoon or something like that. But uh, so we'll try to make one photo over here and one photo downstairs outside, so please join us. Uh, and the other thing that I wanted to tell you is, uh, uh, again, to encourage you uh, to go and in the poster session, to go into the poster session of people that are online and not only go in the poster session in the hall, because there are people online. And yesterday, I was uh, searching over there a little bit and not many people uh, looked into it and it's not very nice because it gives the people a very uh, very uncomfortable uh, uh, feeling uh, that they work, that they put their poster over there and that not, nobody visit them. So go online uh, and check their uh, posters and interact with them uh, and yeah, and that's it. So we, uh, we are going to uh, have our second session today uh, about consciousness and its uh, alterna alternations. Uh, and our first speaker will be uh, Son, uh, Chong Sion. Uh, he got his PhD from the Dresden University, uh, working in neuroimaging research about motor and uh, abstract uh, intention. Uh, and is uh, currently a postdoctoral research uh, at the National University of Singapore. Uh, and he uses uh, wearable and smartphone apps for digital uh, phenotyping of sleeping, uh, physical activity, and mental, uh, mental well being. Uh, and he tried to understand the transition between uh, falling asleep and w waking up. Uh, and he will tell us a little bit about his work. Thank you. Uh, thanks for being here on a Sunday morning. Um, wow, well, pretty amazing to see so many people here already. Um, okay. Yeah, firstly, thanks, Brown, for inviting me to give this talk. Right. Um, so my title, half my title is uh, Flipping the Switch of Consciousness. Right. I will reveal the half uh, at the end. The other half, well. OK, so powering down is essential right, for supporting conscious states. And we need to power down quite a bit. Right. Okay, so for every wakeful and hopefully conscious hour of functionality, right, humans typically require about half an hour of unconsciousness. Right. So sleeping an hour allows us to stay conscious for about you know two to three, right? hours but um yeah if you're like you know sticking to a three that's probably quite unhealthy but i think most of us here are probably around that area okay and right now definitely i haven't gotten enough sleep right so while neural changes right it tends to attract you know our attention our focus but we should perhaps not neglect right the power greed that is um uh, adapting very rapidly to the changing demands of different states of arousal Right, especially during the transitions of consciousness, okay, when we fall asleep and when we wake up, right? So when we fall asleep, um, you know, the heart rate beats a little slower, right? Our breathing slows down, our muscle tone relaxes, right? But, you know, um, it, it doesn't completely shut down, right? The brain is still active, right? But at a lower state, right? If it's completely shut down, that's called death, right? So now, well, um, Okay, right. So, but it's not always like, you know, the long periods of sleep, right, you know, in which we, we sort of lose consciousness, right? And here I'm just using consciousness and uh, losing consciousness in a very loose way, right? Um, so, yeah, just about falling asleep, okay? So I'm not saying that, you know, it, it's, uh, we totally, you know, I become unconscious, but, well, there's a debate there, what is exactly the state um, of consciousness when we are asleep, right? But, well, basically, it is, I think, um, undeniably, right, at a lower energy state, 
our brain, right? Our consciousness, right? So, okay. Now, well, so previously, um, our lab, right, has looked at um, micro sleep, right? And um, micro sleep is typically defined as somewhere between a few seconds, actually, like half a second to uh, 30 seconds, right? Okay. Now, here, it's not technically micro sleep um, data that you're looking at. Right? So in this case, right, um, the subjects have been put through a uh, sleep deprivation paradigm. They were kept, kept awake throughout the night, right, and they were scanned very early in the next morning. Okay, so after this total sleep deprivation, right, um, yeah, we asked them to basically go into the scanner, lie down, right, stand across and um, yeah, try not to fall asleep, right? Which is quite impossible, right? So most of them did, of course, you know, inevitably fall asleep, right? And I will say in a lot of uh, resting state scans, that happens too, and this has been shown, okay? So now what happens to the brain when you fall asleep, right? Typically, you know, when we are looking at um, task-based fMRI, right? So we give a stimulus or whatever, right? A task, you know, and we expect the brain region, right? Um, to become locally more active, right? And that is the signal we are looking for, right? So we expect the bowel signal to increase, okay? I, I don't, I will not go into the physiology underlying that, but basically, you know, you, you'd expect an increase in the bowel signal to correlate with um, neural activity, right? But, you know, what's going on here, right? So when subjects close their eyes, right, we actually see an increase in bowel signal, you know, all across the brain except for the thalamus, right? So you see the blue patch in the middle, right? That's going down in signal, but the um, orange and red, that's, well, higher bow signal, right? Yeah. So, well, if you ask them, you know, it, the same subjects, right? And you know, if you ask them to close their eyes according to what happened, right? When they were um, sleep deprived, right? But this time, you know, you, get, um, you basically uh, well, let them rest, right, and, and what we call rested wakefulness, right, so, and then um, you gave auditory cues, right, to uh, ask them to close and open their eyes, right, well, what happens is that, well, as you would, you know, intuitively expect, right, um, the visual areas, both signal goes down, right, and you close your eyes, okay, so what's the difference between these two, if you take, you know, if you subtract them, right, and um, you will see that, well, the thalamus area sort of like, you know, they, they are sort of uh, going in the same direction, but the rest of the brain, no, right? So it, it still remains there, okay? This um, in higher bowel activation when your eyes are closed, right? And if you see on the right here, right, these are, um, so the top one is the thalamus, right? You see a, a prolonged uh, reduction below the baseline, okay? So that's why it's, it's green here. But um, the other brain areas the, in the cortex, right? Um, yeah, you see, you know, the signal going up, right? So um, red is uh, shorter periods, right? Um, half to four seconds of eye closure, right? And then, you know, um, four to eight and then eight to 12. And basically you see um, something pretty strange, right? Why, why is this happening, right? So um, other people have shown the same thing, right? So, um, <clears throat> yeah, so in this case, um, it, it's a, it's an active task that the subjects are supposed to do, right? It's a driving task, right? So, um, well, they are supposed to keep to um, uh, the track, right? You know, like driving on a road, right? And if you deviate from, um, you know, the, the lane, right? Then, um, yeah, that's considered an error. And, and basically, if you keep deviating, right? You know, then um, it's considered like you're not responsive, okay? And sort of, um, yeah, you're not performing the task, right? And, and, and they consider this kind of micro sleep, right? So coupled with like slow eye closures, okay, which is very typical of, you know, driving, right? Along a boring road, right? Or yeah, or listening to a boring lecture on a Sunday morning. Um, so yeah, well, so this is, you know, pretty, well, it seems to be, um, you know, it, it matches quite well, right? In the cortex, you typically have, um, um, bowel signal going up when your eyes are um, closed, likely asleep, right? 
for transient periods, but you know, it's pretty responsive. Now, but this kind of system wide changes occur not just when you fall asleep. Even when you take a, just a single deep breath in the scanner, right? You see a massive uh, change right across the brain. So um, on the um, the top here in the blue line, right, is a respiratory belt, right? Signal. So yeah, this uh, the red arrow is pointing to a deep breath. Okay. And um, so um, every line, right, in the gray um, area here, right, every line is basically uh, one voxel, right, and the time cost of the voxel, right. And you can see visually very clearly, right, that, you know, when you take a deep breath, something's changed, right. And this changes, you know, yeah, persists for quite a while, right. And this is seen in a lot of studies, so it's very well replicated, right. So taking a deep breath, it seems like your bowl signal across the whole system goes up for a short while and then it goes down right and it takes about half a minute before it comes back to baseline right so now well it, just to step back right you know the bowl signal what does it stand for right? blood oxygen level dependent signal right so you know, when we are doing um, task-based fMRI, we typically assume, right, you know, the subject's awake, right, there's a kind of a stable state in the system, right, and you protect the system with the task, okay? So, um, so arousal, right, transitions though, right, are correlated with all these system-wide changes in the bowel signal, right? So th does this threaten what, you know, we are finding with our, you know, task-related bowel imaging, right? So, well, um, in, the, in that case, we're more interested in local signal changes, right? So it, it's, you know, usually it's quite okay. Okay, and if you're like responding to a task, you're probably awake. So maybe not that many, um, you know, transitions, right? Um, but, well, if the blood supply changes, right, occur in relation to more challenging tasks, right? For example, if you, your heart beats faster because you're, you know, you're going to be more attentive in order to uh, solve the more difficult task, right? Or, <clears throat> yeah, you take a, you know, you breathe deeper or something, right? It could still, right, put up the whole system. And if you do this consistently, then, you know, comparing a more difficult versus an easier task, there may be some differences that could be due to this um, kind of you know, just very physiological changes. Now, what is affect the visibility of fine local patterns, right? So Hakwan shared with us yesterday, right? How, you know, we use fine local patterns, right? To categorize things, right? And a lot has been, um, yeah, done, right? To use this information. So, well, now, yeah, this is uh, my own study, right? And here we are looking at, you know, um, a period without any uh, visual stimulus, right? So first they get an auditory cue, Okay, one out of four categories, right, that the um, subject is supposed to look for, so the target, right. And then six seconds later, we show them these four um, um, pictures, which, well, yeah, has the uh, the target category, and they're supposed to point out which one it is after some scramble mask. Okay, so what we're interested in is during these six seconds of preparation, right, you know, can, can you uh, decode basically what is the auditory cue, right. And indeed, you can, right? So the, the, the exposure, sorry, just to, so yeah, one thing though, you know, this, um, the exposure period, right, for these four images is titrated so that um, basically all of them are performing at 85% accuracy, right? So there was uh, two training uh, runs outside, right? And the, um, yeah, and, and this um, exposure duration is titrated during that time and continues to be adjusted right throughout the fMRI scan. Okay, so what we find is that, right, um, the classification accuracy, right, um, of, right, the target category. So this is the fine uh, local patterns category, right? And um, it basically correlates with um, the stimulus the titrated stimulus duration. So what, what this graph is saying is basically that, you know, if this area of the brain, right, is, um, is prepared, right, okay, to look for the target category, then, right, you will need a less amount of time of, exp of seeing the images to be able to detect your target category. Okay, so I am definitely, you know, yeah, 
in the camp believing in, in the power of looking at defined local patterns. Now, but what about resting state scans? Right, so this is a study that uh, we did to specifically address, right, this issue, okay, of um, transient periods of falling asleep in the scanner, right? So um, the previous two studies that I shared with you on this, right, the microsleep, right, um, that is, um, so in one case, right, there was, so, you know, it's just based on eye closure, right? So we, we don't really save, you know, no, we don't, we can't really say for certain that they have fallen asleep, right? So in the other case, it's more of a behavioral um, kind of microsleep, right? So uh, you're, you, um, you're basing on, on um, you know, the, the continuous uh, behavioral response, the accuracy of it, right, to define microsleep. So in some cases, the subjects may not even have closed their eyes, right? So I wanted to go for a bit more certainty here, right? So we did um, two experiments, right, to look at that. Um, the first one, right, just had fMRI, right, a respiratory belt, right, it just actually, um, I wasn't specifically looking for it, but, you know, the scanner had a belt, I said, well, just, just hook it up, let's see, right, and then, um, after we did the first study, right, so we got, well, a bit of COVID, right, um, but, you know, EEG is sort of like the gold standard, right, for, you know, determining, well, whether someone is falling asleep, uh, has fallen asleep or not. Right. So the original reason why I did not include that was that, well, EEG, you know, sleep staging goes in chunks of 30 seconds, right? And 30 seconds is the max limit of um, the, the classical definition of um, <clears throat> microsleep. So, well, but, well, we got COVID and we added in the EEG. And then we, in, in addition, there's a PPG, which measures the heart rate, right? So these two studies are, very similar. I'm not going to really talk about um, the differences here, but um, just to let you know, right, the difference in the modalities that were measured. Okay. So, yeah. Um, just gonna. So yeah, it was pretty taxing um, um, for the subjects, right? Um, you know, they were asked to go into the scanner for um, three runs of this, right, and uh, two sessions, two on separate days. So in one session, there are three runs, right, and it's like twenty minutes each. And during this 20 minutes, right, um, you know, they, they have to look at the cross, okay, fixate. But unlike most resting state studies, right, uh, we did not force them to keep awake, right? Okay, so we're very nice. We asked them to, um, well, you know, if you if you feel like sleeping, sleep, close your eyes and sleep, that's fine, right? So, but if not, just keep your eyes open, right? And, um, but yeah, every time, you know, every, when they close their eyes, right? So we have this um, camera that's tra tracking them in real time, right? And, you know, looking at the eye closures. And if it goes beyond four seconds, right? We consider that a um, target, right? A potential target for as a microsleep, okay? So, but yeah, we wanted to get a lot of uh, microsleeps. So, uh, we had an upper limit, right? So every time there was this target, right, um, episode, right, for microsleep, we, we would random, pseudo randomly assign a kind of a, a wake up time, right? Okay, so if they did not wake up themselves before that, the, you know, the timing, then we would, um, well, have a wake up call played to wake them up, right? And so you can get really sleepy in a scanner. And, and this, you know, from the simplest, nicest study became very torturous for the subject, actually. Yeah. So, yeah, don't ever sign up for something like that. So anyway, right. Um, so this is, yeah, this is basically showing you, you know, what happens and in, in, in the eye tracking, right. Um, yeah. Okay. Right. So. Oh, yeah. And, and after they woke up, right, then um, you ask them, right. Or you asleep, right? When your eyes were closed just now, right? So, um, yeah, right. So we, we changed the format a little bit because we felt that, you know, the first format might have kept them awake a bit too long and then they can't fall back to sleep again. So, right, we wanted our boost our numbers a little bit, but unfortunately we also, well, face a different problem because we got too successful and EEG is really, really super effective. 
Yeah, it really makes you fall asleep. All right. So um, here, right, um, right. Um, this this is the the uh, each column is one subject, right, in the study, and this is basically counting the number of subjects at diff uh, the number of uh, micro sleep durations, right? Number of micro sleep at different durations. Sorry. Yeah. So um, from the uh, yeah the purple ones at the bottom are four to eight seconds, right? Up to um, red at the top is forty to forty four seconds, right? So in the first study, we, we went up, to, the wake up calls were up to uh, 30 seconds, but in the second one, we increased it up to 40 to 44 seconds, right? So yeah, as you can see, right, there's quite a, quite a, you know, um, if you can see here, the yeah, number here is like, you know, um, 50, 100, 150. So we had quite a bit of a uh, micro sleep um, in, in the scanner, right? But well, uh, we did ask them whether you were asleep or awake, right? So yeah. If they were asleep, okay, um, these are the ones that, that we are t focusing on, right, today. Okay, if they said that they were awake during that period, right, then, yeah, uh, we're not going to look at that today. Okay, so, but, yeah, you can see that, it, um, you know, most of them, right, did say that they were um, asleep, especially when the eye closure duration is longer, okay. But there were still a few who said that they were awake, right, you know, but their eyes were closed, right. And yeah, just disobedient subjects. Terrible. Anyway, um, so so this is uh, the uh, proportion of arousal states, right? Comparing um, so blue, right, is when your eyes were open and awake, right? Okay, the proportion of time you you spend in that state, right? And um, yeah, the orange is when your um, eyes are closed, and then you after that report that you were asleep, right? So you see a fair bit of orange against uh, blue, and um, yeah. So the gray and yellow, not too many of them, right? Your eyes closed, right? But you said, well, you know, you were awake during that period, right? So yeah, in, in the second study, yeah, they spent um, almost half the time, right, asleep, okay? Yeah. All right, so what happens in the brain during these microsleep periods? And well, so we found very, very similar results as, you know, the previous, but in this case, it's kind of a pseudo controlled, um, scenario. So at least we had their subjective report, right, that, well, they were asleep. Okay. So this is, um, yeah, this is across the whole gray matter, all the gray matter voxels, the average of that, right. So um, now each line, right, um, each colored line is a different um, time bin, right, of um, I of uh, micro sleep, right? So we sort of have to bin them together to to create this graph. So visualize to visualize this. Okay. Um. So yeah, it's four to eight seconds, ten to four, fourteen. So basically, um, the, uh, the fMRI was acquired at two seconds. Okay, resolution. Right. Okay. Right. So yeah. Um, and in the thalamus, you see a rather different picture. Right. So I won't go into too much details here because th this matches what um, I, I showed earlier on, right, from the other two studies. It's just that now there seems to be a uh, very prominent dip initially, and then later on it goes up, right. And both the gray matter and thalamus, right, show this dip, right. So if you scrutinize the earlier ones, um, they they have this pattern too, right. But the difference is that you know for the gray matter it went up above baseline, whereas the thalamus it went up a little bit, but it just stayed below baseline. Right, so that's why it was green in the previous studies, right? And the uh, gray matter was orange, red, right? So now there was some regional variability in the bowl changes, right? So it's not just, although it's system-wide changes, but you know, there, there are some um, differences, right? So um, the first row is experiment one, second row experiment two, right? And you see the earliest changes happening, right? In the ventral medial prefrontal cortex, Right. In the calcarine, right, you see the deepest uh, drop at the beginning, very soon after you fall asleep, right. And in Heschel's gyrus, right, you know this is the uh, wake up call basically, right. So yeah, they woke up Heschel's gyrus. Hey, 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 wake up, you know. All right, so it's still active, right, and processing the information. So you get a bigger spike there after you wake up because of the delay in the bowel signal. Okay, um, and this is the EEG um, data. So um, yeah, across the different bands, we see very consistent um, 
um, kind of changes, right, across different micro sleep um, durations, right? And so in micro sleep, right, for behavioral micro sleep, typically people look at the global theta, right, um, to determine that, you know, people have drifted off, right? But it seems that that's actually not the strongest in, in our study, yeah, right? Maybe because, well, you know, uh, they weren't trying to do anything, right? So, yeah. Anyway, so this is a, um, let's play this. So this is a grand summary of everything, right? So I have the respiratory belt, lungs here, right? The eyes, um, the heart in red, right? And um, yeah, the bow signal. Uh, sorry, this uh, the purple is the EEG vigilance. Um, yeah, so it's a measure of uh, using theta and alpha, right? To measure your vigilance, okay? And you see that, well, um, for this, it's um, 40, two seconds of um, eye closure, micro sleep, okay? So you see this, um, you know, system-wide change, right? Uh, it's, uh, yeah, and, and it goes up and down, it fluctuates uh, quite a fair bit, right? And there uh, are particular signatures to that. Um, so just a, a static, right, image here, right? So the initially, initial dip at about six seconds, you see, you know, it, it go down in blue across every, everywhere, right? And then after that, um, yeah, the sleep starts to plateau, the signal goes back up, right? But here you can see that the thalamus is still in blue, okay? And after you wake up, right, there's a bit of a bump in the signal, right? Um, so this is about four seconds after eyes opening, right? And then after that, it goes back down again, right? It could be, you know, going on um, falling asleep in the next episode, right? Because yeah, subjects uh, fell asleep pretty fast again, right? So again, this is, um, yeah, about pretty similar, um, but Cross the so this is just one run and you can see these changes happening, right? Okay, so yeah, and so sort of like you know, yeah, at a, it just one one sample in essence you can see that happening. Yeah, okay, so I gotta jump on. Um, I'm gonna skip the uh, well. So one one of the problems, right, for this poses for a uh, resting state scans is that, you know, um, does it affect, right, the measure of connectivity, right? You know, so resting state scans have yielded a lot of information about different neural networks and all that. But what we found is that, you know, if people fell asleep, right, well, at least a lot, well, in this case, a lot, I mean, so this is an exaggerated uh, scenario, I guess. But yeah, if you fell asleep in the scanner, it does affect, right, the results you get in terms of uh, connectivity the correlation and signal between different brain regions, right? So there, there are techniques to take care of this, but not everyone takes care of these things, right? And uh, yeah, you can also model, you know, the respiration effects, the heart rate changes effects and things like that, but it is not um, uh, always done, yeah, right? So, and you can see parametric changes here, right? So yellow is um, non-sleepers, right? Yeah, and the blue is sleepers. So de depending on, on uh, whether you do global signal regression, so some technical things, but basically you do see that sleep, right? The amount of sleep you, you have in the scanner, okay, correlates with the uh, differences in, in functional connectivity measures, right? So, well, to conclude, microsleep is associated with multiphasic fMRI changes, right? That, and this varies systematically with the duration of your microsleep, right? And the alterations, um, in, in functional connectivity measures, right? Also scales with the frequency of microsleep and it persists after you even, after you regress out the global signal, right? So if you just take a very simple, straightforward approach, it's not gonna get rid of all the problems of uh, related to falling asleep in the scanner, right? So it's important to, uh, you know, really try to keep subjects, um, yeah, awake in the scanner. Right. But these days, uh, resting state scans are getting longer and longer, increasing the chances of falling asleep. Right. Yeah. And on the other hand, if you ask them to please keep awake, it's difficult to assess what exactly, what exactly they are trying to do. Right. You know, when they're struggling to stay awake. So, and, and now I'll just focus on the uh, respiration and heart rate. So as I said earlier on, when you fall asleep, right, you know, your breathing slows down, your heart rate slows down, right? But here, one, one thing that took a while for me to, uh, to realize, and it struck me that, well, if you wake up, 
right? When you're waking up from a low energy state to a high energy state, it's, it makes sense, right, that you want to get a system ready, you know, so you power up, right, pretty fast, right? So you need to, your heart rate goes up, you know, your breathing goes a bit faster, uh, pretty immediately, you know, when you're waking up. But what about falling asleep, right? You're just going into a high to a lower energy state, right? So you, you don't actually, the system doesn't actually have to react that fast, right? It, you know, because like you may be just dozing off and coming up again. So well, it, it, why does the system need to react that fast, right? And, but the strange thing is you see here, right? You know, the orange line here, right? It's four to eight seconds, okay? So respiration goes down immediately. Right, the change is like you know sometimes even a little before you actually fall asleep, and heart rate too. Right, so it, it, it's sort of a bit puzzling. I don't know if it's a, a, um, well a real question in the sense I'm just like this. This thing has been puzzling me for a while, but um, yeah, why 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 are we reacting so quickly? Right, why does the um, heart rate and breathing have to change so quickly? Right. And this struck me, especially because I was, um, my daughter was sick in the hospital, right? And, and uh, they were putting, uh, so like it was a breathing issue. And so they, they measured, right, her heart rate. And, but yeah, it's difficult for her to fall asleep, right? Because of the things that were dangling off her body. So she just kept falling asleep and waking up. And I can see immediately, right, you know, the SpO2, right? Oxy blood oxygen level and heart rate. Just, you can see that changing. You know, really like like this study. You know, very very fast in tune, right? So, reduce respiration and heart rate even for very short durations, right? So this there's this evidence. You know, basically this I think this is quite clear evidence of the very very tight right uh, interplay between autonomic physiology and arousal related fMRI changes, right? But um, so maybe this is a very weird conjecture, right? Um, you know, when, when you, ha uh, you can't sleep, right, when you have insomnia, one of the complaints is that, you know, my heart keeps beating, right? You know, I, I can't slow it down, right? And, and, and I can't sleep. So I'm just wondering, is it what? I, I just realized that, okay, we don't actually know what are the necessary and, and sufficient conditions for falling asleep, right? So maybe that state of lowered, co um, reduced consciousness also requires right, your physiology to be at a lower level, right? Like, you know, if your heart keeps pumping fast, then, well, maybe that's why you can't sleep, right? And I don't know why, right? I don't know if it is true, and I don't know why, but yeah, this is just, um, yeah, maybe, you know, this, j just a conjecture right now, yeah. And uh, if anybody has any ideas on, or, you know, knowledge to the contrary, please let me know. Okay. So this is basically to summarize. So flipping the switch of consciousness, why such tight coupling with breathing and heart rate? Right, that is the question I'm leaving you with. Thank you. And oh yeah, to thank all the people who contributed to the work. Okay. Uh, considering time, we'll take one very short question. Andrew? Yep. Yeah, that's the minute. Uh, amazing talk, really full of great stuff. The, um, I'm very intrigued by your thalamic finding, mm -hmm. and you know the thalamus is quite a compact structure, but it certainly has a lot of different nuclei. And so my two questions are: What do you think is the significance of your uh, thalamic activations and deactivations, and which part of the thalamus do you think you're you're looking at? Right. Um, so I'll answer the second part first. Right. Um, I don't think we have good enough resolution in, in this uh, study to really um, address that. Right. Uh, with, with much confidence. Right. So, um, yeah, with a, with a you know, a higher. Well, if you do multi band, multi echo kind of uh, sequences, you can probably get at that, I think. Yeah. Right. So um, now the significance. Right. So. Well, when you fall asleep, you, you don't want to be processing too much sensory information, right? So you do need the thalamus to say, nah, I'm not, not going to pass on all these signals, right? Yeah, because that would wake you up. But it's not complete shutdown, right? Because, you know, you know auditory, you, you're still processing something. So there's a base level, right? So that, you know, you don't die if some 
risk then threat comes by but yeah you do need it to i think be at a lower state yeah thank you okay thank you very much uh, so we have uh, our second speaker for today uh, yoshida matsatushi yeah. uh, uh, is a neurophysiologist from the uh, Hokida University in Japan and he studied a primate model of blind sight and hemispatial neglect. And recently he is, was working on the eye movement uh, in schizophrenia. Uh, and this is what he's going to tell us uh, about today. So, Lawrence. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, anyway, let me, let me start. Uh, so, uh, I, I'm from Hokkaido University, Japan. And I'm, I'm going to talk about the schizophrenia today. Uh, yeah, let me briefly, briefly introduce myself, uh, but I, I, it's already dis described that I, I want to add some, uh, add some uh, contribution to the community of the consciousness research. So for, uh, I, I've been working on, uh, uh, contribute to the ASSC and con, uh, the con, con, uh, the 2019. And uh, also want to advertise my institute, uh, it's a, uh, the name is Center for Human Nature, Artificial Intelligence, and Neuroscience. So this is the recently started, but the idea is to facilitate interdisciplinary research and education for about uh, humanity and neuroscience and AI. And the, the, uh, there are some uh, several faculties, and each each of them have a different background, like myself, neuroscience or VR or phenomenology or embodied con cognition, and we are. Uh, we're working together. So I think it's one of the most active places for consciousness research in Japan. And then let's start my talk. So it's composed of introduction and uh, experimental study and theoretical study. Uh, first, uh, first part is what is uh, schizophrenia? Schizophrenia is a psychiatric di 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 disease uh, that leads them to misinterpret reality and uh, symptom is uh, 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 it's characterized by a positive symptom, like delusion and hallucination, and a negative symptom. Today, I'm going, uh, 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 I'm going to talk about the positive symptom, like del delusion. Uh, why study schizo schizophrenia for consciousness research? Because uh, schizophrenia affects sensory experience. So famous example is auditory, you know, verbal hallucination or uh, sharing voices, but uh, uh, also, vision is also affected, like hallucination or deformation of vision. Uh, and it's, uh, I think it's uh, important uh, uh, to think about how uh, the symptom develops. But the difficulty in schizophrenia research is uh, uh, it's not a single entity and no single cause and no established animal model. So we need a working hypothesis which explains how the symptom develops. And one candidate is the aberrant salience hypothesis. But, uh, schizophrenia occurs, uh, you know, gra uh, it's gradually, uh, you know, accumulated and uh, fi finally uh, schizophrenia occurs. So, so only when uh, early symptom are combined with social adversity, schizophrenia occurred. So just before psychosis, uh, there's a period called prodromal symptom. To a prodromal period. So this is important because uh, at that pe period, uh, they experience, uh, they, they have a specific experience called aberrant salience. So this is an example of one, uh, uh, one patient recovered from illness and rem remembering uh, what happened in, in, in her uh, prodromal period. I became interested in wide assortment of people, events, places, and ideas which normally would make no impression on me. I felt that there was something overwhelming significance. And by the time uh, she was admitted to the hospital, I have reached the stage of wakefulness that the brilliance of light or the window sail or color of blue in the sky would be so important, I could make me cry. So that's, uh, so that's very uh, strange kind of experience. So based on these observations, some people uh, propose aberrant salience hypothesis. So in, uh, in this hypothesis, uh, first the, uh, the patient uh, experienced uh, uh, some psy psycho uh, psychosocial stress and this sensitized dopamine system of the brain. And this induced uh, aberrant salience, you know, misattribution of salience to irrelevant 
sensory events of souls. And this perplex feeling that crystallizes into paranoid interpretation, such as delusion. Like, uh, for example, uh, uh, the, the patient has a uh, uh, increased salience, so everybody's looking at me and talking about me. Why? It's a public feeling. Why? I can make sense. Everybody wants to, to uh, everybody's going, going to try to kill me or something like that. So that's how the delusion uh, develops. That's, uh, uh, that's uh, this, this hypothesis uh, uh, proposes. Oh, it's interesting, but there's not so much uh, experimental uh, uh, empirical uh, evidence. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to start a uh, new scientific study, uh, uh, eye tracking study. So, uh, so previously I was working on visual salience. So for example, you know, uh, the left image is said, uh, blue, blue, blue part is salient because it's different from others. And then uh, uh, the opposite one, uh, the right one, horizontal bar is salient because it's different from others. So visual salience is subjective uh, perceptual quality, which makes some items stand, stand out from their neighbors. But uh, so it turned out that there's no study uh, detect the uh, aberrant response to visual salience in schizophrenia. So my, my prediction is if aberrant salience hypothesis is correct, then gaze, eye movement towards salient position will be affected in schizophrenia. And that's the case. Anyway, I, I analyzed the data of free viewing uh, uh, tests for, for patient and uh, healthy control subject. So each of them viewed uh, uh, each picture for eight seconds and the uh, eye movement rec recorded. But now I show you the single uh, subject result. So, uh, so in this picture, and we can calculate the saliency map. So which part is salient? So eye and mouth is salient. And this is a case for control subject, eye movement of control subject. So first saccade, second saccade, third saccade is around uh, salient eye, but later saccade is distributed in, into uh, uh, less salient position. But however, uh, in the case of schizophrenia, uh, they are uh, uh, attracted to uh, a salient position for a long time. So to quantify, we, ca we can calculate the saliency value of each case and plot it across each, each subgraph. So this is a result for all, uh, all, uh, all subjects, all images. So you will see in, 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 in Magenda, it's, it's about a healthy control subject. So first saccade is a, look at the most salient position and the value become le, lo, lower. But in schizophrenia subject, it's always higher. So I, uh, uh, this is the main finding of the first, first part of my talk. So aberrant reaction to visual salience. So, and, and this is consistent with aberrant salience hypothesis. And, but I'm, uh, actually, I, I'm not a human, uh, 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 human study people, but uh, uh, my main part is animal study. Uh, let me just skip this. So I move on to uh, uh, test, uh, 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 testing with uh, in, in animal model. So, uh, what I use is a common mouse. It's a small monkey, so no, no human primates. And I injected the ketamine, low dose ketamine, to uh, replicate uh, 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 schizophrenia in next state in animal. So it's a pharmacological model. And uh, we, we get some uh, po positive result. So injection of ketamine, uh, then monkey tend to look at salient position. So uh, now I replicated the finding in, in, in human patient. And then I move on to brain mechanism. So I, I, I was working on calcium imaging and record from uh, uh, posterior parietal cortex because it's important for salience and attention. So I use, uh, uh, use every injection to uh, and show uh, and major calcium signal. And I found that uh, saccadulated activity is enhanced by, by ketamine. So suggesting uh, Evidence accumulation, uh, evidence accumulation for making sucker seems to be affected by ketamine. So this may uh, suggest uh, evidence, um, background mechanism, evidence settings, but it's, it's just ongoing. So this is uh, first, first of my talk. Uh, 
uh, we, uh, we did some experimental study, but it's not finished yet. So, so meanwhile, I also did some uh, theoretical study. So that's the main part. Uh, the, uh, that's the main issue of the next talk. Uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 uh, and uh, this talk. So, so far so good, but uh, the problem is in, in the aberrant salience hypothesis, the concept of salience is not clear. So I think we should, uh, we, we need more theoretical uh, study. So I started with collaboration with philosopher and psychiatrist and, uh, and wrote a paper here. I, unfortunately, it's just, uh, it's written in, in, Jap in Japanese right now. So I, I'm go, I want to reconsider what is serious. So let's start, uh, what, what is serious? So two, there are two kinds of serious. Well, uh, first is uh, sensory serious or visual serious. So, so I, I already told you. And another one is motivational serious. So, for, for example, reward uh, or uh, or some threat stimuli will uh, pay attention. So it, so definition is kind of uh, like this: a psychological process that transform the perception of stimuli, making them attractive or wanted. So motivational salience can be divided into incentive salience for positive reward and fearful salience for negative uh, threats or something. So, so salience can be classified into three categories, perceptual salience, and motivational salience can be subdivided into incentive salience and fearful salience. However, uh, perceptual salience has been studied in vision science, and the motivational salience has been studied in motivation study or addiction study. So the relation between them has not been uh, well clarified. So the aim of the, uh, the theoretical study is to, to clarify the relationship between sensory salience and uh, motivation salience, and to elaborate the base uh, aberrant salience hypothesis based on that. So for, uh, first part is uh, uh, okay. For, uh, uh, first idea is salience can be treated as a folder. So this idea can. Uh, uh, comes from philosophy of psychology. So in, in that, uh, salience can be analyzed in terms of affordance or salient objects, uh, objects that afford attention. So uh, uh, different, uh, affordance is uh, uh, the, the, that of uh, Gibson's one. You know, afford, uh, so definition of affordance is uh, the affordance of uh, environments, uh, what it offer the animal, what it provides, furnishes. So, but, but there is some uh, conceptual problem. So does it make sense to say accord attention because attention is not action, but mental uh, action. But according to McLean's uh, 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 mental affordance hypothesis, it, it seems to be okay. So it satisfies satisfy well, what can be defined as uh, affordance. Then uh, uh, we have another clue uh, com coming from Computational neuroscience. So, idea of uh, salience as uh, affordance can also be supported by a, a computational framework of the brain, the free energy principle, or active inference by Carl Friston. I will, I will provide a minimal uh, explanation. So, uh, in free energy principle, uh, they, uh, they argue that any uh, self organizing system that is at equilibrium with environment must minimize its informational free energy. So let's consider a uh, perception arc action cycle. You know, uh, the agent is surrounded by environment and the agent has a sen sensor and uh, can, uh, can make a, a inference from outside ex external state X uh, in the form of belief QX and make action, action A, and that will affect external state or sensory state. So uh, in this uh, in this schema, perception can be uh, described something like that. So an agent updates the belief QX to minimize its free energy, and also 
uh, action can be described like this. Uh, agent choose an action A, so that uh, the sample uh, sensor, day, uh, sensor state S minimizes its free energy. So in free energy principle, both perception and action can be explained uh, in terms of free energy minimization. And so in this view, action can be uh, treated as a, in the form of inference. So, uh, so the, the, that's why they call active inference. Then let's look at uh, how visual salience can be interpreted in free energy or active in inference. So let's look at this example. So on the on the last picture, so now now the agent look at the uh, look at the lo lower lower left. So uh, there's a kind of, I think it's a flower or something. And on the right, uh, uh, upper right, there's something vague is visible. So the uh, uh, seems to be some. Uh, uh, and so it's some it's salient in a way. So, so how to reduce free energy? So, uh, so making uh, the uh, the answer is making saccard. So making saccard, then uh, the agent may obtain y uh, sensor input y one, you know butterfly or y two moth. In uh, in any way, uh, their their belief become more accurate and. You can calculate mutual information of action A. So action action A, I mean, meaning gaze, gaze toward upper upper right. So then, but, uh, going back to the the present time, time, the the visual salience of upper right can be defined as mutual information of action uh, action A. So being salient is being informative when you choose an action to sample. Uh, sensor input. So based on this, uh, so now we, we can reconsider what is visual salience. So conventional idea, visual salience is a property of image. So it's it's outside or sensation. But in this new idea, visual salience is a property of possible action toward the peripheral vision. So so again, and this indicates the uh, this is consistent with the idea of salience as affordance. So salient position uh, that that that, uh, that affords uh, attention and and uh, and to understand the outside world better. Then uh, then let's think about the uh, relationship between these salients, sensory salients and motivations and uh, salients. So again, from the view of free energy principle uh, and active inference, uh, we can describe like that. So now we are looking at uh, the agent is looking at the lower left. Then there is three salient images, uh, salient object. So visually salient one and incentive salience and fearful salience. So then uh, we can calculate free energy for uh, and to choose action one and two and three. So looking at the high point at the high visual salience reduce free energy. Looking at point of high incentive salience also reduce free energy, and looking away from high fuel salience also reduce free energy. So all of these contribute to active inference, sampling sensory states that are adaptive for the, the agent. So we can, we can say uh, visual salience and motivation salience use uh, common currency in a way. Then. Um, can, now we can characterize salience according to what it affords. So just to remind you, uh, salience can be classified into three categories, perceptual salience and incentive salience and fearful salience. Then let's describe what it affords. So all of them affords attention, but the difference can emerge, uh, uh, it also affords different aspects. For example, in perceptual salience, affords information acquisition. And incentive salience affords reward harvesting. And fearful salience affords active fear response. And the, uh, it has some different aspects. So first one is approach, second one is approach, but uh, fearful salience is a kind of avoidance behavior. So that seems to be the, the difference between them. Then let's consider interaction between them. 
Oh, just to show the, uh, the previous slide in different way. So the, the perceptual salience and the perceptual salience support information acquisition. And incentive salience affords reward harvesting. And fearful salience affords active fear response. Then let's consider the interaction between perceptual salience and incentive salience. So this relationship can be manifested as explore, exploration exploitation trade-off. You know, you, you want to go, uh, look for new, new, new information or uh, obtain um, current, current information or reward or something. So since uh, both of them uh, imply approach, so they have no conflict, but kind of trade-off. On the other hand, this relationship is a bit more uh, difficult. Relationship between perceptual salience and fearful salience can be manifested as, as approach avoidance conflict. You know, perceptual salience affords approach behavior and fearful salience affords avoidance behavior. So it's a relatively difficult task that requires social interaction, like negotiating with a difficult person, something like that. So then let's go back to the, the aberrant salience hypothesis based on this new view. So well, just to remind you, so in our balance sal salient hypothesis, sal uh, sal uh, propose misattribution of salience to irrelevant sensory event or thoughts. But uh, uh, most of the uh, most of the current study in, in interested uh, they interested in in enhancement of motivational salience, uh, especially in incentive salience. However, I think uh, we should uh, think, think differently. So in schizophrenia, both uh, we propose that both perceptual salience and motivational salience are enhanced. Well, motivational salience includes both incentive salience and fearful salience. So that will change the balance between exploration and exploitation trade-off. But I think it's okay. It's it, it's good good aspect of the schizophrenia. It may explain the evolutionary significance of schizophrenia, you know, curiosity and creativity. But the problem occur when they have long-term social stress. Because actually then uh, that will enhance, you know, uh, uh, that, will uh, that will sensitize the uh, dopamine, to, uh, uh, dopamine to receptor response, then fearful salience, overwhelm. Then approach avoidance conflict, uh, 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 cause distress that is so painful that require a cognitive solution to them, like persecutory delusion everybody is trying to kill me or something like that. So that's uh, how we explain based on our new view. So benefit of this new idea is to provide a detailed, detailed explanation of the brain mechanism and provide a new behavior test. Maybe this, con and we, can, uh, we need to find a task to measure how this conflict is severe or not. So to summarize, uh, to reconsider what, what is salience, salience we found uh, uh, salience, uh, we, we can uh, um, treat salience as a four dance and elaborate to elaborate a balanced salience hypothesis. Pro we, we, find, we find that the approach avoidance conflict is a key. Okay, that's all for, for, uh, for my talk. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. We have time for a couple of questions. So. So thank you for a wonderful talk. So I have a question about the classification uh, of um, motivation themes. So um, in many case of schizophrenia, I saw um, there's an interesting phenomenon um, which um, these patients often often have um, a strong motivation to search for fearful uh, stimuli. Like, like for example, some um, patient may have a fantasy about um, all these people around um, them might be a secret agent uh, from, from government want to kill them. And when they um, see, uh, uh, see a clue that can make them uh, identify them as an agent 
and they will say ha gotcha and then the search or this identification itself seems rewarding to the um, patient themselves so and if we see um, this uh, behavior this way it seems to um, the stimulus itself whether it is uh, rewarding or it is a, a, a fearful stimuli is ambiguous so i'm wondering how we uh, tackle this kind of issue in this theory yeah thank you yeah but i, I think it's a form of approachable that's conf uh, enhanced approachable that's conflict you know because uh, uh, they, uh, they, they have to treat uh, fearful salience properly, but uh, maybe perceptual salience is enhanced, so we should avoid, but uh, we want to know, we want to understand. Uh, so the, the urge to add for information acquisition uh, is strong. So, the, so that situation may explain uh, disorganized approach about this conflict in your case. But yes, more questions here? Yeah. So under perceptual salience, you said that that affords an approach behavior. Um, but is that always necessarily the case if information acquisition leads to um, information indicating that avoidance would be prudent? So uh, although I didn't explain more, more but uh, I think uh, uh, information acquisition can be more, more, uh, can be uh, can be understood more broadly. For example, you know, just uh, low-level salience like bright uh, bright light or oriented uh, orientation. This is also informative you know, because you know if it is not uh, ecologically meaningful to my to, to me, it's not salient any anymore. So in this sense, uh, even the very very low-level salience can be treated as information acquisition. That's, a, that's my interpretation. Thanks. Thank you for your very nice talk. Um, like the CMNC capture looks like a um, bottom up process right up at the beginning, but um, for um, like a healthy participants, they try to be. Once they uh, gaze on the like, most salient part, the next step they try to get uh, more information by moving the uh, eyes. It looks like a um, uh, more top down process in the next step because people have more um, information and they want to confirm whether they are uh, getting, uh, getting the right position. And uh, like, do you have any comments on the um, like, different detection to the top down? Indeed. Yeah, thank you very much. That's a good point. Indeed, that's that's how I describe this model, but it's too complex. So I, I put it on kind of static interaction between them, but there, there is some dynamics or learning could occur. For example, you know, for perception salience can be initially bottom up, but the incentive salience or fearful uh, positive reward or negative thing have to be learned. Uh, 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 have to be learned. And so in this in this sense, it it can be uh, uh, that requires some learning pro process. Then then this learning process will affect this in, uh, in inter interrelationship. So so in, in this sense, it's not uh, what I say uh, when I say salience. It's not purely bottom up, but uh, uh, it's, that impo involves some to top down learning base or some some. Uh, uh, some evolutionary inher inherited or developmentally acquired, and it also affect this kind of salience. Thank you very much. Another question. Um, the uh, recent um, patient inference theory uh, um, proposed that uh, schizophrenia has a very solid belief so that it uh, less um, affected by century elders, you will run this elders uh, again, their belief. Uh, um, is your hypothesis like, re uh, relevant or kind of uh, similar to the patient-friends approach? Yeah, that, uh, that, that's true. 
uh, as, as, I told, as, as I told you, I, I, it, the idea is based on free energy principle. And the point, point is, uh, schizophrenia subjects tend to uh, jump into conclusion rather than prior evidence, but the uh, likelihood of stimulus uh, sensory evidence. So in this sense, uh, uh, this change will enhance the salience of stimulus, even though they have some prior knowledge. So that's how Bayesian, uh, Bayesian decision theory you can, can explain this situation. Is this um, phenomenon useful for diagnosis? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's the first part. Okay. Eye movement can di diagnose. Thank you very much for the wonderful talk. And we move on. Thank you. Okay, uh, so the next speaker will be uh, uh, Neil De Domkam. Uh, he's uh, based in Taipei and he uses brain imaging to investigate a number of topics, including a psychiatric condition, disorder of consciousness, and is interested in the neurotransmitters, uh, how neurotransmitters shape the function of the brain. Uh, and he's going to tell us a little bit about the function of GABA in disorder of consciousness. Thanks. Um, so what I'm going to present today is kind of some thoughts in process. Uh, so I might make it a little shorter to try and get some more questions and, and so on, if there are any, because uh, I'm really interested to hear what people think about this. So before I start, can I just see who's familiar with disorders of consciousness as a concept? So the neurologists are. Um, what about GABA as a, a transmitter? Have we get any Okay, just just you. Okay. I don't think that's true. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, just so I know. Um, people that know stuff might be a bit bored by the first part, but here we go anyway. Okay, so just to introduce the source of consciousness and what, what I'm talking about today. I'm referring to uh, syndromes, unresponsive wakefulness syndrome, and to min the minimally conscious state. Um, so these are conditions uh, where patients have had some sort of uh, injury, uh, either from uh, trauma, from stroke, from uh, epoxia and so on, that has caused them to, to be in a state where they retain arousal fluctuations, but they lose any behavioral signs of conscious awareness in unresponsive wakefulness syndrome and a minimally conscious state that's similar, but they have minimal signs of conscious uh, awareness. So emphasizing the behavioral signs part, this makes these conditions extremely challenging from a diagnostic and prognostic viewpoint because uh, all we, Oh, not me, I'm not a doctor, it's not my problem. Um, all doctors can do really is look at how p the patients behave. But of course, that doesn't necessarily tell us what's going on inside their head. And I'm sure lots of you are familiar with uh, conditions such as uh, locked-in syndrome, where people appear completely unconscious uh, behaviorally, but we subsequently discover that they have full consciousness or close to full consciousness. Um, so some of the work I, I, I've been doing is always looking at ways of using different techniques that we can go beyond just behavioral uh, measures to try and identify uh, which patients have consciousness, uh, what level of consciousness, and ideally also what, what kind of prognosis they have. Um, is it worth uh, putting in a lot of intensive medical care for a patient uh, that might ha never regain any form of consciousness or, or other uh, approaches more valid. Okay, so when I'm talking today, I'm primarily going to be talking more about unresponsive wakefulness syndrome, so the, the idea that we have lost consciousness completely, but I'm also open to the idea that this is just a continuum and so uh, everything might apply to both uh, unresponsive wakefulness and to minimally conscious state. So GABA um, is the primary inhibitory neurotransmitter in the, the brain. Um, you can see it here, it's a very simple molecule. Um, it uh, binds to GABA-A and GABA-B receptors and on target neurons, and GABA-A receptors then hyperpolarize uh, those cells and, and stop them 
making it harder for them to be activated. Um, ignore GABA B receptors for today. Um, they're interesting, but not for this. Um, so the GABA A receptor, which we've just shown here, um, it's just it's a transmembrane uh, pore receptor, a channel receptor uh, with a, a pentameric uh, structure. So GABA comes in, it binds to the receptor, it opens up the, the channel, and chloride ions can flow into the, into the cell. Um, I'm going to talk about some compounds shortly uh, that act on the GABA-A uh, receptor. Um, I should have made this a bit larger. Um, these actually uh, uh, don't bind to the GABA binding site, but they get bind to uh, modulatory sites, um, the benzodiazepine site uh, in one case, and, and to uh, the beta uh, uh, subunits in, in the other case. So GABA is synthesized and released primarily um, from uh, GABAergic interneurons. And these are find, found all over the brain and show a great diversity in morphology and uh, specific functions. So they're found uh, usually in uh, located in as uh, groups with excitate, excitatory neurons. And it's also worth mentioning that they're also closely associated with astrocytes and the entire neurovascular uh, unit. Um, it's always worth mentioning uh, astrocytes because they get ignored, but they're very, very important. Um, so everyone that's studying brains, look at astrocytes more. They're pretty cool, um, as are blood vessels, anyway. Um, so these interneurons can release uh, GABA and they will affect the, the way that uh, excitatory neurons uh, fire. So they play an important role in organizing local uh, neuro neuronal population uh, activity structure over time. Now that can be just in terms of a very basic sense, in terms of, okay, they just stop everything happening by, uh, you know, inhibiting the cells completely, but they also play an important role in organizing the, as I say, the temporal structure of activity. They're doing that both in terms of how the local excitatory neurons are, are talking to each other uh, across the different layers and so on within a, a column, but they also play an important role in controlling how local populations respond to incoming excitation from other parts of the brain. So we've got projection uh, axons coming out of a particular uh, part of the brain and going to other parts of the brain to then transfer information to those uh, distal uh, brain regions. So the interneurons are controlling how those uh, uh, projection neurons then influence other parts of the brain. Why that's important should hopefully become clear shortly. So GABA itself is related to consciousness uh, or rather to unconsciousness in several ways, some of which most of you will be very, potentially very familiar with, depending how um, how your student life went. Um, so, I mean, some of you might be on propofol, I don't know. Uh, so a lot of anesthetics, uh, well, commonly used anesthetics uh, act on the GABA receptor. So propofol, for example, that uh, binds to, to some points in the beta uh, subunit, and depending on the dose, either potentiates or, or actively opens the channels, uh, the GABA A receptor channel. We give enough propofol and people will lose consciousness. Uh, I'm sure some of you have been in for operations and have been induced into uh, unconsciousness, so you, you'll know what it's like. They, they put in the propofol, you're there, and then suddenly you're not. Uh, and you, you just appear again a couple of hours later in a different room with bits of you missing, potentially. Um, alcohol also acts in the GABA system, uh, and I've been informed that if you drink enough of it, it can cause unconsciousness, but I wouldn't know anything about that. And a lot of hypnotics uh, act on the GABA system. Um, so, for example, here, a hypnotic called Zolpidem, which is a, a non-benzodiazepine uh, drug that binds the benzodiazepine uh, 
binding site and potentiates GABA. So you take that and hopefully you'll fall asleep. Um, I've tried it when I've had jet lag, didn't work for me, but anyway, that's a separate question. Um, so just based on this evidence, we can see reasons to think that, well, if unconsciousness seems to be closely related to GABA, uh, by extension, perhaps consciousness is closely related to GABA. But this comes on to a little puzzle. So I mentioned Zolpidem, uh, which is a hypnotic. It, if we take it, it puts us to sleep. Weirdly though, if you give it to some patients with disorders of consciousness, so unresponsive wakefulness patients, if you give them Zolpidem, they regain consciousness, which seems completely contradictory to, to how that drug works. And is a remarkable effect because these patients who might have been in long-term um, apparent complete unconsciousness suddenly regain a degree of consciousness. So this effect is seen in, in, a, in a subset of patients. Um, there's been various trials being done, including one being done by, by uh, my, my colleagues. And it seems around 20% of patients have this response to Zolpidem. Um, you give them the drug and they regain a level of consciousness. Um, now, it doesn't always mean they stand up and start walking about, but it could be that they can start responding to questions from, from their family, or at least just showing some sort of response to uh, prompts from their family and so on. So it can be an important uh, response, even if it is relatively minor. But in some cases, it does lead to a complete recovery of consciousness. They can get up and walk about and uh, talk to you. Why does this happen? So that's what I've been trying to think about. Uh, why does all of them seem to have this effect? And I've been thinking about that just because it's a, an interesting little puzzle, but also because I think it might give us clues into the, the, the underlying uh, mechanisms that support consciousness in the human brain. The kind of pre requisite uh, properties of a brain that allow it to be the sort of thing that can have consciousness. I've looked at GABA in disorders of consciousness before, along with uh, colleagues. Uh, Pong Min Chin was the lead author here, um, and we did this in, in Shanghai, where we used uh, flumazenil PET on patients with disorders of consciousness. Um, so flumazenil PET, it binds to the GABA receptors and it can show you where they are in the brain and, and the density, that they, the relative density that they have. So we did this in a set of patients, about 17 patients, and we compared it to, to controls. And as you can see from the, the maps, um, there's quite a notable reduction in GABA A uh, availability in, in the patients. Although interestingly, not in all of them. So you can see that some of the unresponsive wakefulness syndrome patients have uh, relatively well-retained GABA uh, A receptor distributions. But in general, there's an overall suppression of GABA A. That replicated a previous smaller study that found the same thing. Interestingly, though, what we found was that the reten the preservation of the GABA system in the brain was predictive of whether the patients would recover consciousness three months later. Um, so from this uh, plot, we can see that there's some patients that are marked in red. Uh, these are uh, the patients that um, regained a degree of consciousness at three months later. And you can see that their um, relative GABA A uh, availability is clearly higher than the patients. Oh, thank you. Um, clearly higher than the patients who did not regain uh, a degree of consciousness later, which is pretty suggestive. But what might be happening? happening. GABA's, the GABAergic gintin neurons are fundamentally associated with the temporal structure of neuronal activity, uh, neuronal population activity. Uh, 
So we also know, or, or it seems likely, that the ability to have conscious awareness relies upon the transmission of information from sensory regions to other parts of the brain. Um, we can remain agnostic about the specific theory of how that happens or uh, what uh, particular uh, theory of consciousness that we want to go with. Most of them involve, I think, at least some degree or some requirement that information be transferred from one place to another. Is there anyone that thinks that small parts of the brain are conscious by themselves? Because I'd be really interested to hear your argument for that, because that would be quite interesting. OK, so we're all in agreement. Information has to move. This is just an illustration from one of my sure's papers. But in order for information to move, the neural activity has to be coordinated. So we can have an incoming uh, stimulus. Even that incoming stimulus, for there to be an appropriate response within sensory cortex, your interneurons have to be working properly. That's part one. That's not sufficient, though, because you know even if we look at patients who are under propofol anesthesia, if we give them visual or auditory stimuli, you see not normal responses in in visual or auditory cortex, but you see retained responses. The auditory and visual cortex will respond to stimuli in patients who are un in uh, people who are completely unconscious. Similarly, in patients with disorders of consciousness, if you give uh, sensory stimuli, we can see uh, responses within sensory cortex to those stimuli. Indeed, this is quite a good predictor of uh, whether they will recover later, uh, the degree that you see these responses. So step one, our GABAergic interneurons need to be working properly so that we can just have that basic response within uh, sensory cortex. Step two, though, is going on to what I was talking about with these projection neurons, uh, projection connections. For them to be for that activity to be properly propagated, it's not clear exactly what's required, but there seems to be some relation between slow wave activity and higher frequency uh, activity. So for the transmission of activity from sensory cortex to prefrontal cortex, it seems that we need some connection between uh, slow, flu slow wave fluctuations and then the higher frequency uh, sensory, st sensory specific activity. Those slow wave uh, fluctuations uh, are traveling waves. There's lots of different uh, interesting theories that are coming out quite recently. Um, it's quite a cool time to be studying this stuff. Um, are produced, at least in part, by the activity of GABAergic interneurons. So my idea, or it's not my idea, but what I'm saying is that if we lose the activity of these GABAergic into, into neurons, then we can't have these uh, waves that are necessary to transmit the information from one place to the other. Ergo, we don't get any conscious awareness, or we get limited conscious awareness. And we can perhaps look at this in this sort of Everyone likes doing U-shaped curves for things. It uh, makes you feel like you're really doing something. Um, so I'm also giving us a U-shaped curve. It's quite annoying to make them uh, in PowerPoint. Um, so if we have a sort of just right level of GABAergic tone, we have conscious awareness. If we have overactive GABAergic tone, for example, in propofol anesthesia, we lose consciousness because we can't support that information transfer. Our neurons don't talk to each other properly. On the other hand, if we have underactive GABAergic tone, such as in disorders of consciousness, where we've lost that correct uh, uh, GABAergic activity, then we also lose consciousness. Same problem, we can't move information about properly. And that would suggest why Zolpidem does what it does, because Zolpidem is potentiating the GABAergic system. So it might be lifting people out of the bottom of our uh, U-shaped curve and helping them climb up a little bit towards that 
sweet spot where we have the appropriate balance between inhibition and excitation. How long was that? Oh, so long. Okay. Um, okay. Um, okay. Uh, that was quicker than I expected. Uh, so what's still to be done? So as I say, this is just preliminary ideas um, based upon uh, work that I've done in the past and, and, and various things. So there's lots still to be done. So we need additional evidence for GABAergic uh, changes and disorders of consciousness. Uh, the PET experiments that have been done and that we did have a limitation in that the amount of GABA A receptors that can be measured depends on how many neurons are there to, to measure. And in disorders of consciousness, the people's brains don't look great, usually. Um, and so are we measuring something that is specific to the GABAergic system, or is it just a really expensive way of saying this person's lost most of their gray matter? Um, we try and correct for that as best that we can, but it remains an open problem that, you know, statistical correction can't deal with. So we need to get additional evidence using different techniques. Uh, we've been working on acquiring data from patients using magnetic resonance spectroscopy uh, to try and provide an additional uh, avenue of in, uh, evidence. All of that's still limited by the fact that if you don't have any neurons there, you don't have any GABA there either. Um, if anyone's got ideas of how we can do uh, different ways of trying to get at this issue, I'll be very interested to hear. We need to better specify the link between the GABA system and the functional activity patterns of the brain, taking the brain as an overall dynamic system, uh, rather than, there's a lot of work looking obviously at how the GABAergic system influences the very local activity. There's less work looking at how it influences the whole system as uh, and its dynamics. So we need to do more work looking at these questions, I think. And I, uh, some of my students are, are, are looking at this uh, at the moment. So Jim Ming's working on something along these lines and also uh, Fong, who's around somewhere as well. So you can speak to them about that. I'm sure they'll be happy to talk to you. Um, and I think this is a, an area where modeling uh, work would be very helpful, where we can try and model different insults to uh, a toy system of altering the GABAergic tone within it or the inhibitory tone within it and see what that does to the overall system dynamics. Um, obviously our model won't be conscious or maybe it will, who knows. Uh, and so as I say, I'm interested to hear any other ideas that people might have, what, what questions come up, what ideas people might have of things to do. Uh, and if anyone wants to do some stuff, let me know. So that's all for today. Thank you. And I'll be interested in your questions. Okay. Thank you very much for the nice topic. Are there any questions? Yeah. Any of that text for your interesting talk? So I'm curious to hear about your thoughts or comments on this alternative uh, explanation of. of of this uh, GABAergic effect. So, for example, there's a theory proposed by uh, Thomas Heinberg, I believe. So, he's saying that, well, maybe uh, the reason that all these different anesthetics can induce unconscious uh, is because these drugs or these, these substances, uh, they, they don't work on uh, receptors, but directly changing the uh, cell membrane physics, so they, they probably just get combined to the membrane and change the physical property of the membrane. And if that's the case, the, it, it can probably explain why uh, uh, all these, I mean, the same GABAergic effects are, are having different, sometimes conscious, but sometimes unconscious. So I'm just curious to hear about your thoughts about this different theory. Yeah, that, that's a good question. Um... I, I don't know. <laughs> uh, 
So yeah, I, I, I'm aware of the, the the questions around particularly propofol and 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 uh, isoflurane and so on in terms of like what they're actually doing. Um, I wouldn't see it as necessarily being an either or uh, situation. Um, so obviously, propofol's effects are dose dependent. Um, at lower doses, you're getting more anxiolytic quasi anxiolytic effects and then you get higher doses you get that um, lack of uh, loss of consciousness I would be open to there being simultaneous things going on uh, where you might have both the receptor based uh, effects and then at the higher doses it's leading into those um, uh, membrane changes I'm not sure that would affect the, the overall idea here, um, it might just be that that's a particularly extreme uh, end of it. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a really good point. I need to think about that more. Any other questions? Oh. Uh, thank you for the interesting talk. So you're, well, given your presentation, it seems that uh, changes in GABA system might may tell us something about the prominences of patients with disorder of consciousness. Uh, but I was wondering that whether we can use fluctuations in the GABA system as to diagnose, I mean, to be the more fine grained fine grained distinction between the degrees of consciousness with respect to the disorder of consciousness. Because it seems to me that uh, GABA system is well, it has a relation to conscious space, but it doesn't really have a specific correlation with the, you know, the, 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 the degrees to which you know, have the vestige of consciousness. So I'm quite interested in what you're thinking about that. Yeah, um, I suspect that from a diagnostic point of view, it might not, purely for technical reasons, might not be a great approach. Um, Flumazenil is not a good diagnostic or prognostic tool really because it's very difficult to uh, administer. You need a cyclotron. If you don't have a cyclotron, you can't do it. It's very expensive. Um, so from a clinical point of view, kind of useless. Uh, spectroscopy would maybe have a little more potential because it's easily available in, in all MRI scanners. Um, it remains to see whether our project produces coherent results with the, the PET data. Um, diagnosing and the level of consciousness is not easy. Um, I don't think any one tool would provide a robust uh, diagnosis, to be honest. Um, and, and you mentioned the, the question of fluctuations. That, that's another issue of like the GABA systems fluctuating across the day and so on. So, so you know, do we have a diagnostic tool that is robust to time of day effects and so on and so forth, which most imaging tools might not be, just again, purely practical reasons. Um, it's a clinical scanner, you can't just go in any time. Um, short answer. Probably not that useful in terms of like, immediate diagnosis. Um, probably more useful for prognosis, I would guess, because um, we can get a better idea just of the, the, the gross properties of the system. Um, and potentially useful as a support for other uh, tests to try and get a, a robust diagnosis. Any other questions? All right, thank you. So, so you mentioned um, that you know, the gray matter just in general has kind of degraded. So I'm wondering, to what degree can you use essentially a ratio of purchase you know, like an excited patient in addition, uh, either from a spectroscopy perspective or even from a computational modeling perspective to try to get this question? Yeah. Um... My, yeah, I've been a little one-sided today, and I guess, and talking just about GABA and, and, and Lee, but glutamate gets all the 
all, gets all the fun anyway, so I thought I'd balance things out. But yeah, I mean, what we're really talking about is that balance between excitation and inhibition. Um, the grey matter preservation is a bit weird, though, because you get patients whose brain looks perfect, unconscious. You'll get patients whose brain is a complete disaster, much higher levels of consciousness. Um, now, whether that is uh, true over longer terms is a kind of separate question, and that's maybe why I was emphasizing prognosis rather than diagnosis in terms of looking at that um, uh, growth structure, more, so to speak. Um, and that comes back to what I kind of said at the start of what, what I'm interested in here is what are the properties of the system that allow it to have the potential to have consciousness? Um, so from that point of view, yeah, looking more at um, structure and, and gray matter densities and so on, and, and it would be perhaps more useful. So yeah, definitely like modeling uh, inhibition excitation balance would be what we we need to do. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. 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 Last short question. Anyone? Hi, uh, really nice talk. So I'm wondering, uh, have you considered your GABA results in terms of the GMK commodity carbon skin? So is that therapy actually doing anything, or can we use this GABA results to pick up notices about which patients are actually gain from that kind of therapy? So which, which skill, sorry, the coma recovery? The GMK coma recovery skill, in a series of um, fixation, pursue, yeah, we, so that's we use these skills for the behavioural uh, appraisal of the patients. So when 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 we talk about recovery of consciousness, what we mean is an improvement in those skills. Okay, thanks. Okay, let's uh, thank our speaker. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we'll start. Uh, our next speaker uh, is. Uh, Yun Re, right? Uh, no. Uh, he holds an assistant professorship uh, position in the Sonshon National University in Japan, and his primary research focuses on disorder of consciousness and uh, naturalization of uh, intentionality. Additionally, explores simple signaling system, uh, psychophysical law, and artificial moral agency. And he is going to tell us a little bit about uh, minimal consciousness as a clinical exploratory posit. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone, and thank you for attending my talk, and thank you for organizing such a wonderful uh, conference. Uh, so I've been, I've not been speaking English for about three years now, and I hopefully last night's social has activated reactivated my English module. So today I'll be presenting uh, something about minimal consciousness, which nicely trans transits from previous speaker, near Neil's uh, topic. So minimal consciousness, to be a bit more clear, cl to give a, a little more clarification, refers to a state of impaired conscious consciousness uh, characterized by non-reflexive, uh, mostly behavior responses. So uh, I'll... I, well, in, the, in this presentation, I'll try to defend this following hypothesis. The audible task can test minimal consciousness asterisk minus. So I'll be using MCS to refer to minimal consciousness. And what the audible task is, what this asterisk minus means, will be clarified shortly. After giving a very brief introduction, uh, and then I'll be moving on to the case of MCS asterisk plus. And then I'll explain the problems of testing MCS asterisk minus. And I will uh, in introduce several uh, MCS minus behaviors, namely smooth visual pursuit and uh, localization to stimulation. And four, five, six will be about these two specific behavioral responses in MCS minus. And lastly, I'll be uh, explaining some of the remaining problems in relation to uh, the audible task. So, uh, what's the problem? The problem is, it's clinically challenging to distinguish between MCS and 
unresponsive wakefulness syndrome. Well, I, some of you might be more familiar with vegetative state. Uh, well, the old old uh, name of the unresponsive wakefulness syndrome is the vegetative state, but because of some terminological ethical uh, implications, we now uh, have been using replacing this term with unresponsive wakefulness syndrome. So, uh, well, the, it is important to dis give a distinction distinction between these two uh, states of impaired consciousness because MCS is di diagnostically valuable at the same time prognostically valuable because uh, MCS patients uh, might have some sort of inner life in, uh, in contrast to unresponsive wakefulness syndrome patients. Uh, and MCS patients are way better prognostic value compared to unresponsive wakefulness syndrome. So we have to uh, invest more rehabilitation resources onto MCS patients rather than unresponsive wakefulness syndrome. So, and there are some ethical, ethical problems too. Uh, the challenge uh, in most of cases uh, stems from the fact that MCS non-responsive beha non responsive behavior is sometimes very difficult to tell uh, whether it is responsive or non-responsive because it's very subtle to give the distinction between two, these two types of uh, responses. And there are various behavioral diagnostic tools for testing MCS, uh, such as CRSR, uh, which consists of various types of behavior evidence. Uh, despite the fact that we have various behavioral tools, uh, a study shows that 41% of acute patients are misdiagnosed as being in unresponsive wakefulness syndrome instead of MCS. So it's very hard to detect MCS uh, at the patient's bedside. Uh, well, uh, more there's a more fundamental problem, which is despite uh, sort of applying long-term behavior assessment can improve the diagnostic accuracy, still there may be some MCS patients who do have residual consciousness, but really have no capacity to exhibit overt behavior. So behaviorally, they look like unresponsive unrespons wakefulness syndrome patient, but in fact, they have some residual consciousness. To explain more about this problem, uh, I should introduce uh, a sub more uh, fine-grained subcategorization of non-reflexive behavior responses in MCS. So MCS plus includes the following uh, behavioral responses, command following, intelligible verbalization, functional object use, and so on. And MCS minus includes the following behavior responses, smooth visual pursuit, which I'll be using SVP for the short term, localization to stimulation, emotional responses, and so on. And MCS asterisk refers to the MCS state with no conscious behavior. So there can be MCS asterisk plus or MCS asterisk minus. So the, the question that I'm trying to uh, bring up in the presentation is this, what makes these non-reflexive behavior responses non-reflexive? So, so what's the nature of this non-reflexiveness? Or sometimes uh, some papers use uh, volition, but there's not too much differences. Uh, and with respect to MCS plus, we have an answer to this question uh, because some of many studies show that uh, there's a close relationship between uh, command following and language function. A study shows that command following and language function are neuroanatomically related, and other studies show that MCS plus patients have enhanced residual language function. And other related study also shows that residual language function predicts functional, recover, functional recovery. So it has a residual language function has prognostic value, which means that given this study results, we can conclude that testing MCS asterisk plus uh, can be done by, uh, by, by, by seeing whether a patient has a residual language function. Well, ever since uh, Owen and his colleagues seminar experiment has been done in 2006, many clinicians and neuroscientists has been using this mental imagery task. As you can see in the picture, uh, to give a very short introduction to this very famous task that Owen and his colleagues asked their patients to imagine playing tennis and observed uh, motor areas uh, in, the, in the corresponding somatotopic map 
to see whether the patient is actually following the command. And uh, many different uh, researchers have replicated this similar mental imagery task. Kurz et al. Uh, used EEG, Park et al. used uh, related breathing to uh, mental imagery task. C et al. related, I think, blood test to uh, mental imagery task. So, so far, so good. For, for, for MCS asterisk plus, we have a measure to test, uh, we have a way to test whether the patient has residual MCS asterisk state, asterisk plus state, without appealing to their behavior aspects. But the problem is MCS asterisk minus. So uh, what does MCS minus behavior, uh, behavior responses mean? Well, it really have a gloss over collective uh, sense of uh, sense. I mean, these responses include non-linguistic, non-reflexive behavior responses, that's all. And uh, in this presentation, I'll be discussing two different MCS minus behavior responses. One is SVP, which means reliably and smoothly visually attending to a moving target. And the other one is localization to stimulation, which means attending to particular stimulation, such as uh, global audibles, while ignoring other stimulation, which are called local audibles. So here the question is, what makes these MCS minus behavior responses non-reflexive? What underlies this non-reflexiveness? So in, by answering this question, we can uh, find a proper tool proper diagnostic tool for testing MCS asterisk minus. Uh, well, in case of SVP, uh, many studies show a close, clo very close intimate relationship between uh, eye tracking and working memory. So MCS minus patients can track their own face in mirror. meter. Many different uh, studies have shown this, as you can see in the picture. And this SVP, has prognostic value. And uh, st studies on healthy participants show that SVP, the smooth, smooth visual person, requires attentive tracking of a moving source. What really interesting is that this attentive tracking, uh, according to studies on healthy participants, show that this attentive tracking intimately relates to working memory. And other related studies shows that uh, unresponsive wakefulness syndrome patients retain the capacity for visual fixation, which means that uh, the, the capacity to, you, to uh, fix your eyeballs onto a static target doesn't really have, have any bearing on either diagnosis of residual consciousness or prognosis of, prognosis of conscious states. So it's, it's not the visual fixation, but tracking of a moving visual, visual, visually moving target that has clinical significance. In other words, SVP is clinically significant because of its relations to working memory guided attention to a visually moving target. So we can see that SVP has a, has a, uh, has a clinical significance because it, it's a relation to working memory. So we can find a similar implication with respect to uh, auditor localization or localization simulation. And uh, let me first bring up, uh, discuss something about the behavioral auditory localization. A, a study shows that MCS minus patients can orient their heads uh, or their eyes towards an auditory stimulus. So in, at the bedside of patients, uh, like if you clap, you can see the patient's uh, head is moving towards the uh, sound source of the sound. And patients with auditory localization have higher survival rate after two years of follow-up, which means that uh, behavior auditory localization have a, has a prognosis value. And uh, healthy participants' uh, pupil uh, dilation shows that they attend to global audibles while ignoring local audibles. So I would call this the audible task. What is really int intriguing about this uh, study is that even in the absence of verbal instruction to count the global audibles, we can see that healthy participants' proper dilation reflects that they attend to these global audibles, which means that uh, behavioral auditory localization is not really a command-following response. 
it, we, we can observe uh, behavior auditor localization uh, in the absence of any instruction to pay attention to a particular uh, a sound or try to count the audible, count the local audibles. And we can measure this uh, localization to stimulation uh, without involving any behavior signs, and namely by in terms of P3B responses. P3B responses, uh, the picture is uh, uh, EEG recording of P3B responses indicating, indicating that the subject detected global audibles while ignoring local audibles. So uh, MCS patients show P3B responses in the audibles uh, in, in various types of uh, sensory modalities, auditory pa paradigms and uh, viral tactile paradigms. And this P3B responses, just like the behavioral localization to stimulation, have prognostic value. And MCS patients show P3B responses in the absence of verbal instruction to count global audibles. So some studies show, some studies uh, take it that uh, the instruction to count global audibles is essential to elicit the P3B responses, but uh, this study shows that that's not the case. And healthy participants, P3B responses reflect working memory guided attention. Most importantly, healthy participants' P3B responses relate to host perceptual process, such as working memory, but it does not relate to language function-related perceptual awareness. So recent study shows that P3B responses is not really about language function, but rather about uh, something about the uh, exact, executive function, such as working memory. So therefore, we can conclude that P3B responses are clinically significant because of their relation to working memory guided attention to a specific stimulus, but not to language function. So in principle, the audible task uh, can test MCS asterisk minus. Well, to give a, a, a bit more description of the audible task is, you hide on uh, like uh, salient auditory stimuli inside of local stimuli, and to see that if a patient or subject can can detect this hidden hidden global audibles, uh, which is hidden inside of the local audibles. Okay, good. But we still have some remaining problems. Uh, by comparing between SVP and P3B responses, uh, we can see that uh, the audible task is not really a uh, sufficient way of reducing this number of uh, errors in diagnosis. So SVP is not moderated by deficits of working memory. Uh, in the absence of instruction to visually attend to a specific target, we see that there's no meaningful uh, significant difference between healthy participants and autistic participants. Healthy participants without def the deficits and autistic participants are known to have uh, working memory deficits. but uh, when the uh, verbal instruction is not given, uh, there's no meaningful difference between the capacity of SVP with these two groups. So therefore, we can conclude that SVP does not require fully functioning working memory. The problem is, as P3B responses are not like this. P3B responses are weaker with autistic participants. So deficits in working memory seems to relate to uh, weak signals of P3B responses. And P3B responses are not observed in some patients emerged from MCS, as well as some patients in, uh, in MCS plus. And evidence of attention, which is measured by pupil dilation, is weaker with healthy participants in the absence of instructions to count global audible. So this, it, this study shows that although language function does not consist in P3B responses, however, uh, language, well, verbal instructions can instrumentally enhance uh, P3B responses. So we can see that uh, a supplementary tool for testing residual working memory or MCS asterisk is needed. In other words, because P3B responses require some sort of fully functioning working memory. Uh, so the audible task is not really one single way to test MCS asterisk minus. So we need whatever it is. I, I, well, in the 
in the paper, I'm trying to give a give. A, I'm trying to propose a sort of a, a test design for 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 this for this as 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 this for a supplementary tool, but I will not go into details of that. But however, we can see that uh, the audible task is not enough. Thank you. Okay, so I, I will ask one question. Uh, so, uh, if I understand you right, we have a problem with each one of the method that uh, to, to detect this uh, negative unconsciousness uh, clients. Uh, what about some kind of a hierarchical scheme of uh, detection? So, you don't use, I mean, you can use many methods together, combine them in some kind of a hierarchical scheme. And then maybe that will end mm -hmm. up better than anything, any single test. Mm -hmm. Yes. So in terms of MCS plus, there are various hierarch well, in the hier hierarchical sense, there are, are many different tools to measure the various degrees of conscious uh, MCS plus. But the problem is, well, as well as MCS minus. But the problem is those test tools are things that involve essentially involve behavioral evidence. So the the, the reason that I'm bring, bring that I, that I'm bringing up this issue, this topic into onto this table is because uh, it seems very clear that there are patients who do have some sort of residual consciousness, but such residual consciousness can in principle be dissociated from uh, whatever the capacity you have to make a more more responses. So uh, then, uh, do we have any tools to measure this degree of consciousness without appealing to overt behavioral evidence? Uh, not really. I mean, even 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 the recent studies. Uh, that relates to this topic concentra concentrates on language function in most of cases. Functional uh, fMRI studies, there are various forms of fMRI studies that try to uh, measure the residual consciousness in terms of language function by giving them commands to and and see what their what their what their what sort of changes are happening in their in their uh, brain. But uh, as far as I know, there are not many, just one or two, that try to test this residual consciousness without giving any commands. So the problem is then, how do we know whether this patient has residual consciousness, consciousness without mediating their, mediating their responses without involving language? So that's the, that's the crucial question that I think uh, clinicians need to answer. Thank you. We thank the, the speaker. And we will move to the last speaker. Okay, so uh, we have our last uh, speaker for this uh, very long session. Uh, it is. It is a long session. Uh, so, Guai uh, Tong Wu. I, do I pronounce it correctly? Uh, yeah, it's uh, Qian Tong Wu. Qian, okay, so yeah. Qian Tong Wu is a PhD candidate uh, majoring in philosophy at the National uh, University of Singapore. Her research is focuses uh, on including the material basis of human conscious experience, dreaming experience, and applied uh, epistemology. She's currently working on uh, the sub subjectivity of dreaming experience. Uh, and the echo chamber form through the internet. And she's going to tell us a little bit about dreaming experiences as an immersive imagination. Okay. Um, uh, hello everyone, thanks for having me here. Um, today the topic of my presentation is dreaming as an immersive imagination. And by the way, uh, I'm not sure if the connection will, will stay stable uh, along my presentation. So if you find it hard to hear me, please feel free to tell me by raising a hand or, or, or type something in the chat box. 
hopefully I will recognize that. Okay, so uh, again, uh, the, the topic of my presentation today is dreaming as an immersive imagination. This is actually part of my PhD thesis and also part of two papers that I'm working on. So I appreciate any feedback and comments uh, at the end of this presentation uh, because they will be uh, helpful for my modification of my thesis and also the papers that I'm working on. So, um, yeah, so the outline for today's presentation. In the first part, I will talk about the problem with dream studying nowadays. And in the second part, I will introduce the inactivist interpretation of conscious experiences. And in the third part, I will explain the immersive imagination model of dreams, which is inspired by inactivist interpretation of conscious experience. So, uh, first of all, the problems with dream studies nowadays. The first problem is the lack of real-time outward criteria. This is actually a problem that is uh, uh, raised and uh, 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 challenged by uh, people from back, back in the 1950s. For example, Malcolm in his book, uh, Dreaming, which was published in 1959, suggests that the content of dreams lack the outward criteria for its establishment and verification. And he quoted Wittgenstein in his book by saying that an inner process stands in need of outward criteria. That is to say, if there is an inner process that is without any real-time outward criteria, uh, Malcolm suggests that and that experiences should be nonsense. And he concluded from this by saying that dreams are nonsense. And of course, this is a very extreme uh, a, a way of interpreting the dreaming experiences. But um, there are in fact uh, still problems, even in today's uh, study on dreaming experiences, because we very much rely on subjective introspection when we gather dream reports still. And the interpretations of neural activities largely depend on dream reports. And there are ambiguities of dream reports, which was uh, proposed by, say, in 1976, Stennett already proposed the cassette theory which claims that uh, we actually do not have any experience while we are dreaming, okay? So any contents of the dream reports are composed by us after we awake. So actually the dreaming state is a, just a unconscious process of composing uh, uh, stories and a story will only reveal to us after we awake. And then it suggests that, well, okay, we, we, need to, we need empirical study to deny the cassette theory. If there are no empirical studies that can deny the cassette theory, so maybe that is actually what happened in dreams. And also more, uh, in more recent times, Svitskabel, Eric Svitskabel uh, proposed the dream coloring experiment who find that um, subjects report about the coloring in their dreams are actually quite elusive, okay? their reports can change because of environmental factors, okay? And it's hard to decide whether it's the, it is the environment factors that are, that are influencing the process of reporting or it's the environmental factors that are influencing uh, 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 the process of dreaming. So basically what Svitskabo says is that, okay, dream reports cannot tell us a valid and decisive story of what exactly happen when we are dreaming. And I think all of these problems come down to the problem with dream reports. Because while we are dreaming, we are in fact without any outward criteria. That is to say, okay, I, I dream of an elephant, say, but of course there are no elephants in my room, okay? So that is what without outward criteria suggests, okay? However, we use the same language to describe what happens during waking and dreaming states, okay? So although there is a difference between seeing an elephant in real life and seeing an elephant in our dream, nevertheless, we use the same language to, to describe these experiences, okay? So what we talk about our, our dreams is different from what we tell about our waking experiences. Nevertheless, we use the same language to describe them. And uh, Malcolm in his book actually uh, 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 proposed that the language is, is the same and the sense of individual words are the same, but the mode of employment of each sentence and the whole narration is different and special. But what exactly is this difference? Um, and I propose that the inactivist interpretation of conscious experiences can actually uh, explain this difference. 
So um, the inactivist interpretation of conscious experiences emphasize a lot on the subjective perspective that is embedded in conscious experience. In particular, these subjective perspective depends on a codependent structure between the subject and the physical world due to a proper interaction between the physical body and the environment. And it is because of these proper interaction that the subject can be properly situated in the physical environment, which contribute to a continuous flow of experience from a particular perspective, which is the basic nature of our waking experiences. So during waking state, the subjective perspective is normal, okay, because the subject is properly situated in the physical world. And the subjective perspective in this case is stable, continuous, and codependent with the physical world. And I suggest this is the key to distinguishing dreaming from waking experiences. Why? Because during dreaming experiences, the subjective experience, uh, the subjective perspective embedded in experiences is quite different. It could be very unstable, could be discontinuous. And while we are dreaming, although certain level of cognitive abilities remain, the subject can fail to recognize the absurd happenings in dreams. There are empirical evidences that support this disrupted subjective perspective. For example, I think most of us have the experience of flying while we are dreaming. However, while we are dreaming, we are not aware of the absurdity of us being able to fly, right? And also there are uh, uh, empirical results that shows that subject can report by saying that, okay, I talked to my wife while I was dreaming, but in fact, the subject is, does, well, he does not have a wife in real life, but while he is dreaming, he is not aware of this fact. He doesn't, doesn't feel that it's absurd for him to talk to his wife while he's dreaming, although he does not really have a wife. So there is a lack of, sorry for this. There's a certain level of self-awareness that is lacking in dreams. And I suggest that this is uh, characterized by the loss of situatedness. That is the lack of interaction with the environment while the subject is dreaming. In this case, the dreaming experiences actually do not satisfy the conditions of being a perceptual experiences. And I propose that in this case, the dream is actually a special type of imagination that the subject immerses herself or himself in. So what exactly is imagination in the inactivist sense? Um, Evan Thompson proposed that, sorry, proposed that imagination is a representation. Um, representation that does not uh, refer to representation. Okay, it's a representation. In this case, imagination is self-evoked, and the content of the representation is experienced by the subject as absent at the moment and not directly accessible. And this concept is proposed in contrast with presentation in Thompson's book. Um, so presentation refers to perceptual experiences when the, sub, when the object of perception is present and directly accessible. And in this case, in the case of presentation, the subject is properly situated in the environment and the perceptual activities are constrained by environmental stimuli and sensory motor knowledge. In contrast, uh, in, re in the case of representation, the, re the, the experienced representation is not constrained, not that much constrained by environmental stimuli and sensory motor knowledge. So dreams as, as imagination is very special compared to uh, normal imagination while we are awake. Firstly, dreams are unconsciously imagined by the dreaming subject, meaning that the subject is in fact not aware of the self-invoked imagination. Okay, he or she is not aware that he is only imagining something. And secondly, dreams are phenomenally similar to perceptual experiences. So this is quite different from waking imagination because the subject while dreaming can mistakenly experiences the content of the dreams as present instead of re-present in, uh, in the inactivist sense. So dreaming experiences are not real experiences, but in most cases, the subject is not aware of this while he or she is dreaming. He or she will only realize this is, uh, this is just a dream 
after he or she is awake. And um, so uh, dreams as an imagination is special because this type of imagination has lose, lose the proper situation as suggested by the inactivist. Okay, so dreaming as an imagination is without, oh, or it as, uh, is with a disrupted subjective perspective. And the consequence of this disrupted subjective perspective include, firstly, there is a sub disrupted codependent structure, meaning that it's harder for the subject to, to establish a stable sense of the self-other distinction, which makes it hard to distinguish what is self-involved and what is in the environment, supposedly lead to the immersiveness of an imagination. And also another consequence is that there are no environmental references, meaning that there's no confirmation or disconfirmation of the content of the dreams, preventing the subject from realizing that something could be wrong. And thirdly, there's no constraints from the environmental factors. In this case, imagination becomes cognitively less demanding, okay? So imagination, uh, dreams as an imagination is cognitively less demanding than waking imagination. And in this case, it's harder for the subject to be aware of her own intention of imagining, which makes it easier for him or her to experience vividly. So I have explained uh, uh, why the inactivist framework can interpret dreaming experiences as a, spe as a special type of imagination. But many people will question that, okay, why not regard dreaming experiences as a hallucination? This is in fact a orthodox view as well. Uh, regarding dreaming as an hallucination. Well, mm, my response to that is that hallucinating subjects, although they are hallucinating, they are still situated in the environment, which is different from a dreaming subject. So because of the situatedness, the hallucinating subjects are not necessarily unaware of the fact that they are hallucinating. Okay, It is possible for them to fail to distinguish what is her hallucination and what is the reality, but it is not necessary that she will be unaware of the fact that she is actually hallucinating. And also a hallucinating subject can react to his or her hallucination and tries to get rid of them, although many of them may fail to do so. So the conclusion is dreams under the inactive framework are imaginations that resemble perceptual experiences during waking states. And the loss of situatedness explains the similarity between dreaming and waking experiences, that is, the immersiveness, the vividness, and also the distinction between the representation of experience during waking state and dreaming state. Dreaming experiences cannot be wrong or verified in the same way as waking experiences, because they are fundamentally imaginations instead of perceptual experiences situated in the environment. So the problem with dream reports I mentioned in the very beginning of this presentation is in fact not the problem of after criteria, okay? Because subjects can forget their dreams, but as long as the disruptions in the memorizing process are minimized and the subject do not intentionally lie, the dream report can reflect the actual content of the dreams, regardless of whether there are after criteria uh, corresponding to the content of the dreams or not. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, any questions? Um, I can see one in the chat box. We'll first take uh, this one and then uh, one from the chat book maybe. Oh, oh okay. Thank you very much for the very uh, thought, deeply thought provoking talk. And uh, when you say uh, representation, it means uh, the ones you, things you perceive in the, this real world, it's kind of uh, going through what Tristan calls uh, illusory conjunction. Like uh, it's the parts are there, but it's kind of a, uh, conjuncted in a very meaningless, nonsensical way that's not really in accordance with the reality. 
Um, so, so you're asking about um, the the exact definition of representation. Is that what your question is? Uh, so, like, uh, are are there anything that's genuinely generated inside the dream? Uh, which is representation because uh, people like Carl Jung they say like during the dreams patients may encounter something that never that they've never experienced before because it taps onto you know archetype or stuff like that but according to the representation uh thesis statement it's more like uh representing what we've experienced already in the waking hour so ju just wanted to uh question that because it kind of relates to what uh yesterday's talk about aphantasia about generation of visual imagery whether it's generated so i'm also interested in what aphantastic patients whether they dream or not but that's besides the topic but just wanted to know about the representation yeah um so uh the uh, uh, Thompson's definition of representation is does not necessarily mean that it's a representation of what the subject has uh, experienced before, because he character uh, categorized imagination as a type of represent representation as well. And of course, we can imagine something that we have never experienced before, and never existing in reality even. Okay, so representation in this case is only uh, 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 referred to a process when the subject tries to re-experience or tries to evoke a experience of something in his or her mind. So um, the, the, the reason uh, Thompson does not use re representation but use representation is that uh, he thinks in, well, say in the case of imagination, the subject is not um, trying to gather representations of different elements and uh, resemble them into something that can represent something uh, real in real life. He tries to argue that um, imagination as a representation is that is we try to evoke the experience process of encountering something. And that something could be something that has ex we have experienced, or it could be something that has never existed existing before like a unicorn or like a fairy tale or like something that uh well that is absurd or surreal okay so that's uh that's the um definition of representation by thompson and uh you're right uh by 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 saying that uh well I, i'm also quite interested in the in the case of a fantastic uh uh, uh patients actually um well I, I looked I, I looked into some of the literature about uh, the dreaming experiences of a fantastic, uh, a fantastic uh, picture uh, patients, and some papers suggest that they can have a certain level of dreaming experiences regardless of their inability to evoke a visual image when they are awake. And well, however, some papers suggest that. Uh, well, they cannot. Um, but I, I think I need to dig deeper into, um, uh, uh, yeah, dig deeper into the literature to see um, how people or how this account can be accommodated with uh, the case of infantistic patients having dreaming experiences. Thank you for that. Yeah. Thank you very much. So, we'll take you. We'll take yeah, we'll take the, the, the question from the chat. Let me just uh, read it for people. Uh, uh, I wonder uh, how will your uh, inactive account uh, interpret uh, the case of dreaming while sleepwalking? In this case, it seems that uh, the interaction with the environment exists. Will you say that this is the special case of dreaming, which is uh, more close to walking, uh, uh, waking uh, imagination or perceptual experience? And I would add, uh, what about lucid dreaming? Uh, yeah, so um, in the case of dream walking, uh, uh, sleepwalking, sorry, uh, sleepwalking, I think it's uh, kind of similar with uh, the patients with uh, R R REM, REM disorder. So basically the, the patients can act in the environment while they are still dreaming. 
And my answer to that is that uh, although there are actions uh, um, for the patients who is stream walking or who uh, is uh, suffering from REM disorder, I think the actions, well, um, the action is directed to the actual environment while the patient is experiencing something in his or her dreams. And in this case, um, I don't think there is a proper interaction between the subject and the environment because what he or she is experiencing is different from what his body tries to in interact with uh, while he's dreaming. So there is a this this connection between um, the subject and the part of his or her body's interaction with the actual environment. So I, I will not consider that as a proper situation this under the, the inactivist framework. There could be something wrong in 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 these uh, in these uh, special cases, but I don't think there is a proper situation this. And in terms of lucid dreaming, my explanation to lucid dreaming is that um, well, you're lose, uh, uh, well, the lucid dreamers can be considered as in a, in a stage that's between complete wakefulness and, and like uh, normal dreaming. So basically the lucid dreamers, uh, most of the lucid dreamers can have a certain level of re reaction with the environmental stimuli. Some lucid dreamer can even like react to the instruction by the experimenters while they are lucid dreaming. And I would suggest that the reason why lucid dreamer can be aware to a certain uh, extent, can be aware of their dreaming states is because of this partially um, restore of this interaction with the environment. But they are not like completely restoring the interaction. They are just partially restoring the, uh, the the interaction. That's why they can be partially in dreams, but also partially be aware of that. Okay, I'm I'm just dreaming, and then I can even control what I dream about. That's my answer to that. Okay. Um. Sorry, there are a couple. There is one more uh, question in the chat, and there are other question uh, over here from the audience. So what I suggest is that if any anyone has more question, you can go to the chilling room to go to online to chilling room number one, and then interact and have uh, more question with the speaker. And we will thank her very much for now. Uh, so give her thank applause. You. Thank you very much. <laughs>